I'd like to make a quick video talking about switch bounce and how to debounce switches. I mentioned that I had a debounce reset switch in my Z80 board design and that I used a flip flop and I did it in a standard way. And I just like to go in more detail about what that is all about. So what's the actual problem? Well, an ideal switch, if you have a switch that's open, it, one side's connected to 5 volts, one side is connected to one of your GPIO pins, your pin is going to read 0 volts. No problem. It'll be a steady 0 volts. And ideally, when you close a switch, it bumps up to 5 volts, and it'll be read in as a logic 1. And it'll be a steady logic one until the switch opens again, in which point it'll the pin will drop to zero volts and your reading will drop to logic zero. But switches aren't ideal. So what really happens is, yes, initially when it's open, you're at a constant zero. But when you close the switch, what happens is this contact here, the the this lever here, let's think of it as a lever inside the switch. This lever here makes contact with this contact, but whether it's a toggle switch or a push button switch, when it first makes the contact, it will come up to 5 volts, but then it'll bounce back because of the physics of the thing. You've hit this thing against the contact, and because of physics, it bounces up away from the contact, dropping down to zero volts. And then it bounces back to the contact, coming back up to five volts. And it'll repeat that bouncing as it dampens out. It's springy, so it'll dampen out and eventually it'll be a constant five volts. Same thing interestingly happens when you open the switch. It doesn't just open cleanly. As the lever departs the contact, it may bounce back to touch the contact several times as it's being released from the contact. So it's potential even when you open a switch to get bounce. Now, what's this going to be like from your point of view of your GPIO pin? If you are using polling and polling that pin, you will see all those transitions because potentially your processor is fast enough to catch the transitions. And if you're using interrupts, it's potential, depending on how you set the interrupts up, that you'll get several interrupts for each switch transition because of the bouncing. And that may cause trouble. It depends on what your software is doing. Now, in the case of a reset switch where this is wired to a reset pin, potentially the processor will go in and out of reset rapidly, which is not terrible. And if, if the bounce is rapid enough, the processors have minimum cycles for reset to be low before it, it acknowledges it. And so they kind of do a little bit of debouncing, and we'll talk about that kind of debounce. But if you got software that's doing logic based on a GPIO pin, you're going to have your software logic gyrating as the switch bounces. So one way in software, whether it's on an interrupt or whether you're pulling it, is when you see any transition from the steady state to the new state, you can trust that that is an actual transition. But in order to avoid the gyrations of the bounce, you could put a software delay in before you'll look again for a transition. And you can make an estimate on how long to delay to cover up how long it takes this Thing to dampen the bouncing. There's two other approaches I know of. One is with a resistor and capacitor combination on the GPIO side of the switch that basically uses RC time constant to essentially do the hardware delay 
in how long it will take for that switch to make a transition. It's either going to charge or discharge a capacitor, and that takes time. So as it's bouncing during that, it gets kind of gets ignored by that time it takes to charge or discharge a capacitor. So I don't like that approach because, for one thing, I have to do some math and I have to make a decision about how much bouncing this switch is going to do. Same thing with software delay loops. I have to make a decision about how long it's going to bounce. But there's another approach that costs a, a logic chip, but these chips are cheap. And that is to use a flip-flop. And the type of flip-flop we're going to look at is a set-reset flip-flop. This is a negative transition set and a negative transition reset. So they're active low. So those are inputs, set and reset. And Q and not Q are outputs. And not Q is always the negation of Q, obviously. The truth table for a set reset flip-flop looks like this. If set is high and reset is high, well, neither is active. So it's Q previous and not Q previous. So whatever it was, it remains the same. Whatever the output was, the output remains the same. If set goes low, given that it's active low and we're setting, and reset is, stays high, meaning we're doing nothing with reset, then Q will go high and not Q will go low. If set stays high, meaning it's doing nothing, and reset goes low, meaning it's active, Q will go low and not Q will go high. And then there's another case where they both go low and the comment here is, don't do that. That's an unstable condition for this kind of flip-flop. And you'll see in our debound circuit, it can't happen. So let's look at the circuit. And here's a classic drawing of a set-reset flip-flop. And the first thing to look at is set is pulled high to 5 volts and reset is pulled high to 5 volts. That means if if there's no connection to this point, then this will be 5 volts. If there's no connection to this point, this will be 5 volts. So in the, in the state where the switch has them both disconnected, they're both high, and that means don't do anything. Q and not Q stay the same. So we use a double pole switch where the common is tied to ground and it's going to be in a state. Now, if it's a toggle switch, there is an on state and an off state, we're going to call it. In a push button switch, a momentary contact switch, there's going to be a normally closed state and a pushed closed state. So let's call this a push button switch. And right now it's in the unpushed position. And so when this thing powers up, reset is grounded. So upon power up, Q is going to be zero because we've grounded it here at the base of this, of this resistor. And set, because it has no connection, is going to be high, meaning it's not active. So in this case, like I said, Q will be zero or low. When you switch it to push the button, Let's say we're not talking about bouncing yet, but you move this lever up here. In that case, reset is disconnected, so it's high, and set is connected, so it's low. So that sets Q to 1, or high, and not Q to low. Now let's look at the case of when there's bouncing. For one thing, let's look at this switch in the intermediate state. In the intermediate state, as it's traveling from not being pushed to being pushed, both of them are disconnected, so they're both high, meaning in this intermediate zone, Q and not Q can't change. So it's only when there's contact that Q and not Q can change. 
So now let's put it back in the original state and we say that it's in the reset state. So Q is low, not Q is high. Now as we start flipping the switch, it's gonna it's gonna bounce, but you notice something because the way the switch is constructed, it can't possibly bounce between those two contacts. What it does is it bounces against the contact it's leaving. And then as it approaches this contact, it bounces against the contact it's approaching. But let's go back to here. It's in reset. If it bounces against the reset, nothing really is going to happen because it'll go to both disconnected and reset connected. Well, both disconnected, it stays with Q low and not Q high. And when reset gets connected in, in that bounce, well, that's still Q low and not Q high. So it's going to bounce between two states where there's no change. And then as it approaches this contact, it's going to, because there's a low going transition on S, it's going to make Q go high and not Q go low. It might very quickly bounce away from it, but now we're back at the disconnected state where there's no change and then it'll bounce again onto the contact, well, there's still no change because S is now low and we're setting it to the same value. So you can see because of the way the switch is constructed that it can't bounce between the two contacts because that's too far to bounce. And the way the flip-flop logic table works, the bounces cause no change in state. So that's how a set reset flip-flop debounces a switch. Now it does mean that you have to use a double pole switch to do this. There may be arrangements that I have seen but I don't quite believe yet where you can do it with a single pole switch but I just bought a double pole switch for my application. A nice thing about this arrangement is the flip-flop will power up in a known state. In certain other debound circuits that use logic gates and even flip flops, they have to have special power up circuitry to make sure they power up in a known state. But if you look at this arrangement, you can see since reset is tied to the normally closed side of the switch. That means that reset is grounded right from power up. So the value of Q will always be low upon power up. There's no chance it can power up with Q high. So now we have a known power up state. Now you have to decide what kind of switch do you want this to be? Do you want it to be a normally high switch or a normally low switch? In the case of a reset switch, you want it to be normally high, and when you push the button, it goes low to cause it to reset, because reset is typically active low. In that case, you tie not Q to your reset pin, because the circuit powers up and is held with not Q in the high state, and when you press the button, Q will go high and not Q will go low and the low is what you want for reset. On the other hand, if you're tying this to a GPIO pin, you have a choice of either. And so if you want your GPIO pin to be normally high, you would tie it to not Q. And if you want it to be normally low, you would tie it to Q. Now, of course, if you wire this switch the other way around, where S is connected to the normally closed side of the switch, then the situation is reversed. It will power up with Q being high instead of Q being low and not Q being low. So again, you make the choice of whether you're going to attach Q or not Q to your GPIO pin or your reset pin. Now let's look at a real world application. Are you going to buy a set reset flip-flop? 
Well, in my board, I needed to divide by two, and that you normally do with a D flip flop. And the D flip flop that I bought is a 7474, and it has the D input, the clock input, and set and reset. So if you look at the truth table for that flip flop, it looks like this. And what we have in this case, it's more complicated because it has. They call it pre. Well, that's our active low S. They call it CLR. That's our active low R. Reset. So active low set, active low reset. They've got a, a positive edge transition clock and D. Now, when we are looking at it as a, a set reset flip flop, we have this section here. And it's the same truth table as what I showed you. And here's the high, high state where you see D is a don't care and clock is low. So basically what I did in my design is we're using this half of this dual flip flop. I wired reset with a pull up resistor to one of the poles of the switch. I wired set to a pull-up resistor to one of the poles of the switch, and I wired common to ground. I pulled D and CP down to ground. So I followed this truth table exactly, so that clock is low when I've got the high, high state, and I don't care about D. So since D is a don't care, but you don't want to leave an open input on a chip, I tie it to ground, and because the truth table says high, high, and high, high on set and reset and low on clock give you the previous Q, Q naught and not Q naught. That matches the original truth table. So that's a, a quick intro to what switch bounce is and a couple approaches to eliminate switch bounce. And my preferred approach is using this flip flop. That's it.